Good morning and a very warm welcome to our Sunday service. If you're with us live on, on Facebook or whether you're watching us uh, later on, perhaps on, on YouTube, you're extremely welcome and we're delighted to have you with us. Are things feeling perhaps a little dark for you this morning? My prayer as we, as we begin is that our service will break in just that little bit of light that you need. And we're going to begin our service this morning with sung worship. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Christ alone, cornerstone. Yeah. 
Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Prayers of Penitence Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil, and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Like Mary at the tomb, we fail to grasp the wonder of your presence. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Like the disciples behind locked doors, we are afraid to be seen as your followers. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Like Thomas in the upper room, we are slow to believe. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for today, the second Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lissa will now bring God's Word to us. But if you can, why don't you just go and, and grab a Bible. The reading is Psalm 88. Uh, if you've got one at hand, just go and grab a Bible, and then why don't you just Keep it open in front of you as we then talk about it. Today's reading is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 88. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, 
who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lays heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and I cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in this place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. Darkness. A very powerful image. The word darkness conjures up uh, different things in our minds, doesn't it? But they're all pretty powerful and usually rather unsettling. My favourite moment from the uh, signature track of the biggest selling album of all time, Michael Jackson's Thriller, is when suddenly and from seemingly nowhere, the great Vincent Price suddenly bellows out, darkness falls across the land. You may be feeling that COVID-19 is a darkness that has fallen across our land, across the globe. If this psalm has a theme, it is darkness. The word is mentioned in verse 6, verse 12, and then in its signing off, my closest friend is darkness. It may even be the darkest psalm in the whole Psalter. There's no happy ending. There is no, but from my darkness I look to you, O Lord, and, and you are my light. Or any, but I remember your wondrous deeds of old, Lord, and I know you will not abandon me forever. There is none of that. No, it's just one man's I was going to say descent into darkness, but that wouldn't be right. He's already there. This is one man's vocal despair from amidst the depths of his darkness. Having just heard it read, we might immediately wonder, just what on earth is this doing in the Bible? Just what purpose does it serve? Well, I'll come to that in a minute. But first, let's just look at what's going on here. The psalm opens with the psalmist declaring, God, I know it's you who saves me. And so I come to you and pray before you day and night. Yet he goes on to describe both a darkness that's in his life and a darkness that's consuming his own heart, his own soul. In his life, verse 8, he feels like God's taken his friends from him and that he's confined and trapped. Can you relate to that right now? And verse 9, he's grieving badly, greatly. But he also describes the darkness that's in his soul. Verse 6, he feels in the darkest depths. Verse 7, and verses 15 to 17, he feels like God is punishing him. And verse 14, that God has abandoned him. And then finally, verse 18, that darkness itself is now his closest friend. Why? Verses 3 to 5 tell us that he thinks he's facing death. And he's lamenting. Why? Why, God? When I worship you, 
when I pray to you day and night. And in verses 10 to 12, you can imagine him shaking his fists to the heavens as he resonates with God. God, do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Subtext. So why are you sending me there? This is uncontrollable, gut-wrenching stuff. So why is this in the Bible? What purpose does it serve? Well, there's at least three good reasons. And they're all important to us. They're all important for us, especially during times such as these. The first reason is this. Don't think that being a Christian, and even being a, a good Christian, praying and worshipping God daily, will spare you from periods of darkness in your life. It won't. Let me just add the caveat. If you're not a Christian, you're certainly not going to be spared from life's darkness. One way or another, you can't escape the darkness of death that ultimately awaits you. But leaving that aside, this psalm is also saying to us Christians, this life will also bring you times, and perhaps prolonged times, of darkness. Several places in the Bible make this clear. This psalm is one of them. The book of Ecclesiastes is certainly another, as is the book of Job. I'll come back to Job shortly. But even Jesus warned us, in this world you will have trouble, he said. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, don't have high or falsely high expectations. Not for this life. But obviously, in the life to come, it will be so, so different. So, yes, don't be surprised to experience some dark times in your life. Darkness is not just something that comes if you're bad. And neither is it something we can avoid by being good. A second reason that we have this psalm is that it's during these dark times that we learn both about God and also about, well, ourselves. Firstly, God. In his commentary on this psalm, the great Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner writes this. The very presence of these prayers in Scripture, such as Psalm 88, is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they are desperate. In other words, the fact that God ordained that Psalm 88 is even in the Bible testifies to his understanding of us. You see, God didn't have to allow this psalm into his written word to us. He chose to put it there. It's like there could be a note attached at the end that says, From your Father in heaven. I know. I get it. I understand. So even when we pray like this, angry and desperate, God still draws alongside us. It says to us, I am your God. Not because you do everything right. Not because you're happy or sad. Not because you're at peace or in despair. But because I am the God of grace. And I understand. I remember hearing the great American preacher and pastor, Tim Keller, saying that he's learned ten times more about the grace of God through the dark times than he has at, at any other. Secondly, 
this psalm provides an example for how, during the dark times, we learn about ourselves. How so? Well, it's during those dark times we really learn how much we really do actually love God. We discover just how much of our relationship to God is actually transactional. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we might all think we love Jesus. But how can you know whether you actually love him purely for who he is? Or whether you maybe hadn't even realized it, but you worship him and God because of the blessings and peace that you'll think you'll get from them. You see that? Transactional. Do you love them for who they are? Or ultimately, do you love them because of the blessings that you'll get in return? That is a tough question to wrestle with. I mean, did you ever have a friend, um, or rather, did you ever have an experience where you thought you had a you had a good friend, and it turned out they were only really interested in what they could get from you? That's a tough thing to discover, isn't it? Well, what if? You don't really love God. You don't really love Christ. You think you do. But actually, deep down, it's just what's promised. The peace and the blessings and the hope that you get that is really the reason. How would you know? Yes, I am literally playing devil's advocate right now. The entire book of Job is predicated on that very question. Satan suggests that this is the situation with Job, that he doesn't really love God. It's only God's blessings that keep him worshipping him. And so in a sense, the whole book of Job is about him being plunged into darkness and suffering just to prove his love and faithfulness to God after all. I know what I'm saying does sound like a question from Satan, but it's a question he asks of us too. Yes, to bring doubt, but it's our own resources of endurance and perseverance in God during our dark times that reveal to us that we're in Christ and he in us regardless that we do love him for him and not just for our own benefit. As most of you know, despite awful suffering, Job never turned away from God, which meant Satan was defeated. Similarly, going back to this psalm and the psalmist, who is he addressing this fierce lament to? Not Baal, not Marduk, not Dagon, not any of the other gods in the Old Testament, but still to Yahweh. However dark he feels, Yahweh is still his God, and he is sticking with him. Friends, it is only through our dark times that we discover the strength and core of our faith. And when we discover that about ourselves, that we are sticking to Jesus regardless, then however dark things may seem, all the stronger we and our faith will be. Okay, to the to the third and, and final reason I want to cover with you this morning. The darker it is now, the brighter it will be when the glorious illumination comes. Blind Bartimaeus, who'd been in darkness, blind since birth. None of us can even imagine how inspired, how awestruck, 
how beautiful the world must have looked to him once Jesus healed him. I haven't left my house for five weeks now. But right now, I can tell you that never before have I appreciated having a back garden and being able to sit in it as I have uh, preparing this. Never before have I delighted so much in just breathing in that fresh air when I walk outside, that fresh spring air. Never before have I appreciated God's creation and beauty all around me, the beautiful majesty of the trees, the fragrant smell of the flowers, and the, and the sweet singing of the birds. So it is with Christ. If all of our life's experiences were just the flowers, sunsets and rainbows, amidst an idyllic joy and peace, that is to come, by the way, a new Eden. For more on that, go back uh, on our Facebook page or YouTube channel uh, and listen to the sermon from Good Friday. But if those things were all we experience now in this life, how could we even begin to know just what Christ endured for us on that day, on that Good Friday? The darker things are now in this life, all the brighter and more glorious that new Eden will be. If you've kept that Bible open, just look with me again at verse 10. The psalmist says, Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? The answer is, if you believe in Jesus, Yes, emphatically, yes. Because of Jesus, we will one day rise up in praise to him. Friends, we suffer for various reasons. One of them is that we might remember him, he who suffered for us. On that Good Friday, Jesus was abandoned that we might know we never will be. And the gospel tells us that the darkness fell across the whole land for three hours before he died. Infinite darkness fell upon him that we might know there will one day be for us infinite glorious light. So, friends, hang in there. Our God is moulding us. Christ is with us. And Christ is our light. Amen. Shining.
now bring us our prayers of intercession. Father, as we come near you, we remember that Christ is risen and is alive today, and we know that we will never be alone, because he's promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. What a wonderful God you are, your always loving and caring Father, who has adopted us into his family and made us your sons and daughters. Abba, Father, we love you. You alone are the great and mighty God who holds the whole world and universe in your hands, and yet you delight in your children and are so pleased to hear their prayers. As we worship you this morning, we remember that we are a part of a great family of your people around the world who today are also bringing to you their worship and their praise. Lord, we bring to you the epidemic of coronavirus, which is affecting the whole world. We pray for mercy in Jesus' name that this will come to an end. We know that only good things come from you, Father, but destruction and death comes from the evil one. You know how many are grieving at the loss of loved ones, how many are afraid, and the way it will affect the global economy. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for our government and their response in putting people's lives and livelihood first. We thank you for the recovery of our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and ask that he might know that, that you, Lord, have been merciful to him and that he may want to put his trust in you. We thank you for the good things in this crisis, which has brought people together to love, care and appreciate one another. Thank you for everyone working in the NHS, care homes, emergency and essential services. May they know your protection from the virus and your love and kindness. O High King of Heaven, have mercy on our land. Revive your church. Send the Holy Spirit for the sake of the lost and broken. May your kingdom come to our nation in Jesus' mighty name. In your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the sick. Let's quietly name them before the Lord in a short time of silence. Gathering our prayers and praises together, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A crown of thorns placed on his head He knew that he would soon be dead He said, did you forget me if I 
father did you They nailed him to a wooden cross Soon all the world would feel the loss Of Christ the King before us Hallelujah 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 Then lifted his face up to the sky Said, I am coming home now, Father, to you A reed which held his final sip Was gently lifted to his lips He drank his last and gave
joining us for our service this morning. Under normal circumstances, I'd invite you all over to the church centre for a cuppa and a natter. Obviously, I can't do that. But instead, why don't you go and pop the kettle on and then have a nice chat on the phone or on social media to someone that you've missed seeing in church this morning. So stay safe, stay strong, and stay above all else. Stay close to Christ. And may God, who through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us victory, may he give you joy and peace in your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.